Good morning. How are we doing this morning? Glad that you're here with us, whether in person or joining us online. If you have a Bible, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 this morning is where we're going to be. Um, Did you know that you make 35,000 decisions a day? Think about that. 35,000 decisions a day is, is what we on average make. That, that ends up being about 2,000 decisions an hour if you, take out, if you take out sleeping. We make a lot of decisions every day throughout the entire day. In fact, the moment your feet hit the floor, the decisions just start flowing, right? Are you having coffee today or not having coffee today? Are you taking a shower today or not taking a shower today? Like it just starts, right? And it's rampant and we make them all day long, 35,000 decisions a day. The question this morning is this, what, what determines what you do every day? What determines what you do every day? Here's what I know. Every person here wears a variety of hats. You have a variety of roles, a variety of relationships that all need our time and our energy. So no wonder we on an individual level make 35,000 decisions a day. It's a lot of decisions. And sometimes the decisions we make give us energy. And sometimes the decisions we make actually drain us. But no matter what, there's times where we feel like we're being pulled in a variety of different directions because of the decisions that we actually have to make. What if I could tell you today that you could know without a shadow of a doubt what God actually wants for your life? What if I told you right now that you can leave here with no more guessing What if you can have 100% clarity on what God would actually have for you? You see, before you make the next decision, you need to know there's the decision before the decision. And the decision before the decision comes down to six words out of the mouth of Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount. Right? And these words are incredibly important. And they're important to the life and the ministry of Redemption Church. And, And these words are words that we need to take to heart. And they speak to why we exist as a church. In Matthew 6, 33, I want you to see it. In your Bible, check it out with me. It says, Jesus says this, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Listen, there are six words that just came out of the mouth of Christ that are actually worldview changing. And those six words are this, Seek first the kingdom of God. These six words define what a biblical worldview is versus a worldly worldview. Now, to be honest with you, many of you have a a worldly worldview and you don't even know it. A year ago, I I shared some data uh, from the Barna Group who did a national study and they found this, that 6% of Americans, only 6% have a biblical worldview. Now, that doesn't shock me at all. Are you paying attention to what's happening in the world right now, right? That doesn't actually shock me at all. What, what shocked me is the stats within the church. Because the stats within the church said this, that only 17% of Christians, those who profess that, that Jesus is the Christ and is their Savior, only 17% actually have a biblical worldview. Now, I shared some of this over a year ago, but here's the implication of that. That means that 83% of you don't actually have a biblical worldview. Not good. By the way, the stats get even worse. 37% of pastors, only 37% have a biblical worldview. That means right now, pastors all over our city are getting up, I, I, I think, to open up God's word. And like 63% of them don't even have a biblical worldview. Is that alarming? This, the words out of Christ's mouth can transform your heart and your life and continue to mold the culture of Redemption Church. Because that redemption, here's what we believe, that God's word matters most. Do you agree? Right? His words, his way, his opinion matters more than mine. And so I think this verse we're going to look at today has uh, individual implications in your life, but also it speaks to the need for us corporately what we should actually be about. And so what determines what you do every day? We're going to break down these six words, specifically three words, seek first in kingdom. 
The first word, seek, it means this, that our pursuit involves intentional decisions. Let's look at the verse again, just so we can again see it over and over again. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. What is the first word of the six-word phrase? It's the word seek. Hey, church, this is not a suggestion for you. This is not a suggestion This is actually not an idea. This is not something just to consider. Jesus is saying, if you follow me, this is a command. Jesus is speaking to what should be primary in your life. And if Jesus is speaking to what should be primary in your life, he's also defining then what should be secondary in your life. And here's the challenge that we have in our city. I don't know if you've seen this before. I've seen it in my own life. Maybe you've seen it in your own own life too, is that we love to make secondary things primary things. We all do it (laughs) in many different ways. But what Jesus is saying is that what is primary is always going to flow into what is actually secondary. And so what Jesus is saying with the word seek is he's, he's speaking to intentionality with how we actually live. That what he wants us to do is live our life with an eternal goal in mind more than earthly goals. This means that what you pursue, that what you run to in your life really matters. And Jesus is simply saying this, that many of us need to stop pursuing secondary things as primary things. And we need to start pursuing the primary one because it will inform every secondary thing in our life. Are you making secondary things primary things, friends? Because whatever's primary is going to dictate all the decisions that you actually make in your life. If I could say it this way, I would say this, that what you seek today determines what you'll cherish tomorrow. What you seek today is going to determine what you actually cherish tomorrow. So think about what a biblical worldview would do. A biblical worldview is going to make decisions with tomorrow in mind, with eternity in mind. A worldly worldview, though, is going to make decisions with this moment in mind. How do you tend to make decisions? Because what you're intentional about is going to affect what our church is about. This is not just on the leadership of Redemption Church. This is on each and every one of us pursuing the heart of the Father and being about the things that God wants us to be about. Seek first the kingdom. And so if Redemption Church is your home church, here's what that means. It means that you're buying into the mission of connecting people to Jesus for life change. I believe that that mission is worthy of your life. Which then means that when we meet corporately, it's not just about us, what we do on a Sunday morning to connect people to Jesus for life change, but it's about how we leave this place where we set up chairs and we set everything up to do a service. We get to leave here and take that mission into our families and into our neighbors and into our sporting events and every other event and workplace we're in during the week. The mission goes with you because it's that important. Here's the thing about our mission. Our mission of connecting people to Jesus for life change is a family thing. It's a church community thing. And it's activated not just when we're here, it's activated when we leave. So here's a great question that I need to ask myself too. What gets in the way of us seeking the very things that Jesus wants us to seek? Let's read. Go back up to verse 25 with me. Look at what Jesus says. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body or or what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns and your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not more of, are, are you not of more value than they? And if which of you being anxious can add a single hour to the span of his life? And, and why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field and how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. 
Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things. Worldly world you. Seek after these things. Let your heavenly Father, look and listen to this. Take this to the bank. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Hey, church, what happens when we make secondary things primary things? Here's the answer. Worry and anxiety. Ever worried before? Ever had anxiety before? What does Jesus say in verse 27? Which of you being anxious and in your worry is actually able to even add an hour to your life? Please know, when our focus in life is only about adding things to our life, like food, drink, or clothes, the result in your life will be terrible anxiety and worry. What did Jesus say in verse 32 at the end? Your heavenly Father knows that you need some. Is that what Jesus says? Your heavenly Father knows that you need what? All. He knows absolutely everything you need. And if he is primary, he's saying this, make me primary and you will have everything you need. Here's the challenge. Your worry and your anxiety is absolutely legit if Jesus is not king of your life. You have every reason to worry and be afraid and be scared and nervous of Christ if Jesus isn't the savior of your life. These are legit reasons that you should be afraid, overwhelmed, and scared because without Christ, there is no salvation from your sin. There's no freedom from this world that what you get in this world is the best you actually have to offer and the kingdom of hell is waiting for you. But if Jesus is primary, if he's the one we're seeking, here's what he tells his, his, his people. Stop being anxious. I want to respond back to him to you. Here's what I want to say. Hey, hey, Jesus, are you paying attention to what's happening in our world right now? Like, I got to worry about my own marriage. I got to worry about my own children and raising them up to follow you. And I got to worry about protecting them from the world that we're actually in, let alone all the evilness that's happening in our world, let alone inflation is ridiculous and we're overpaying for milk. <laughs> There's lots to worry about. In fact, it seems that all we should be doing is worrying. This is a safe place to be known. So can I just say, we all struggle with worry. Do you agree? Um, who's with me? Um, anyone here ever, anyone here never been anxious before? <laughs> Here's what God does. God continually puts you in positions where you need him to come through. Here's our problem. When God does that, anxiety and worry is our first response, Right? And we can't stand it, but we do it. Have you learned these lessons? That worry never adds value to your life, but only depletes you of life? Have you learned the lesson that never one time when I've been anxious or worried did it add any value to my life? <coughs> Here, here's what I've seen. When my anxiety is high and my worry is high, it robs me of being a good husband and it robs me of being a good dad. Have you experienced that? It never adds any value to our hearts or to our life. Yeah, I can review my life and say, you know what? There's been tons of worry in my life. I think back to my wife being diagnosed with cancer 11 months into our marriage, battled for seven years, came back four different times. When the doctor tells you that cancer is going to take your wife's life, <laughs> anxiety, right? Worry. It's scary. When we moved home from North Carolina to Plant Redemption Church here, there was lots of worry. Are we going to make it past week one? Our first offering was $173. Worry. 
anxiety. When we adopted our three kids, zero kids to three kids, Maybe you've heard Jim Gaffigan, the comedian, talk about all his children, and it feels like he's treading water, and they keep handing him babies, right? (laughs) Worry. Anxiety. Finding a church home, for me, looking at 20-something different places, has created crazy worry and anxiety. And then God makes it clear, 92% of our people say, go get this home. From our church, we go get the home, and now I have anxiety and worry still. The question is not, will you experience anxiety and worry in your life? The question is, will you surrender it to the one who's primary? And what you do with your worry and what you do with your anxiety actually reveals who's primary in your life. And so Jesus is saying this, if I'm primary, you can stop worrying and and start seeking the right things. You see what Jesus said in verse 30? I want you to see it. We don't have time to unpack everything in this. Look at the last phrase that Jesus says in verse 30. He says this, oh, you, Uh, can we just take our pointer finger and put it on our chest for a minute. Oh, you of what? Of great, amazing faith, Jesus says. Brilliant, world-changing faith. He says, no, oh, you of little faith. Jesus calls our worry and our, and our anxiety a lack of faith. In other words, let me say it this way. Your worry, my worry, our anxiety is a sign of unbelief. Because here's what anxiety says. Anxiety gets up and works up on our life and says, you know what? I may not get what I need, so therefore I need to try to take control to actually grab it. Now here's the problem. We put ourselves in the primary position then. And when we put ourselves in the primary position, anxiety causes us to think very little about God. And when we think very little about God, we'll we'll realize that we're actually minimizing God's thoughts on us. Maybe you've said this before. Anxiety will say this. God can handle heaven, but he can't handle my life. God can handle dealing with my damnation, but he can't, he can't deliver me from the details that I'm facing today. Yet yeah, here's what God is saying. Look again at the end of verse 32. I want you to see it with your own eyes. Your heavenly father knows that you need them all. What determines what you do every day? Here's the second word. It's the word First. Look at the phrase again. I'm, 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 I got I to gotta pick up my pace. I'm going to speak faster, okay? Verse 33 says this, but seek then first. First is this, our priority involves an intentional direction. Here's what Jesus is saying with the word first. You don't start, you don't start your decision making with what you need to add in your life. You start your decision making with me. That's what he's saying. You start it with me. Your pursuit in life actually starts here. The direction we set our gaze is vertically on him. Here's the problem for us. Can we just be honest in West Michigan? The problem for us is not that Jesus is not important. Everyone here would probably say that he's important. We want to pray to him. We want to serve him. We want to worship him. We do want to give him glory. Like these are all true things about what we would say to be if we're going to be honest on our life. Here's the honest statement. We'll surely give Jesus a top 10 spot in our life. Top 10's good. That makes the ESPN plays every Friday. Top 10. Here's the thing. Jesus is not interested in your list. <laughs> He's not interested in your top 10. Jesus demands this, that he is first, that he's saying, I am priority number one. So let's just be honest. We don't trust what Jesus says because we don't trust who Jesus is. Yet in the text, Jesus says this, God cares about birds and lilies. How much more he's going to care for those who are created in his own image. Jesus is saying, everything that I'm saying is trustworthy. This past Monday in the holiday, we were sitting at our table as a family eating lunch. 
and my wife bought a watermelon. Now, she forgot to buy the seedless watermelon, which we learned was a huge mistake at this table for lunch for my oldest son. He has pieces of watermelon. He's working the watermelon. He's never had seeds in his watermelon or trying to tell him this is how we grew up. I don't know what happened to get the seeds out. I have questions about that. (laughs) But he's complaining about the seeds in the watermelon. So I got so fed up with this complaining, I literally said to him, I said, if you swallow the seeds, here's the danger. You will grow watermelons out your ears. (laughs) Now he looks at me, he's almost 10. He looks at me like, whatever, dad. But my youngest son, Johnny, he throws his hands up puts his hands in his face and he starts bawling his eyes out uncontrollably. And you'd think in that moment I would say, I'm just kidding, Johnny, but that's not what I did. I could see the worry starting to build up in him as he's bawling his eyes out at the table. And I said, Johnny, did, did you eat some watermelon seeds? He goes, yes. I said, you're going to grow watermelons out your ears loses it all over again. And then at that moment, that was the right moment to step in and say, hey, son, I'm just kidding. What I'm saying isn't actually trustworthy. Do you believe what Christ is saying is trustworthy? Seek me, he says, and these things will be added to you. Seek me and your needs will be met. Don't seek the need, seek me. When worry is present in our life, it's a very clear sign, church, that your priorities are out of whack. It's a very clear sign that your priorities are out of order. And so Jesus is saying this, don't allow things in this world to trump me. Yet when I look at our city, I'll say this, everything trumps Christ because Christ is in the 10th spot. So there's nine other things of importance there. And so our work trumps them, our family trumps them, our hobbies trump them, our politics trump them, our sports trump them. He's saying, I'm first and I inform every decision you make. What determines what you do every day? Thirdly, seek first. And the third word is kingdom. And that means this, that our purpose involves an intentional destination. Look again at the sixth word. Seek first the kingdom of God. Now we've said that these six words are a biblical worldview setting statement. Seek first the kingdom of God. Here's the thing. Hey, church, Jesus has done a lot of cool things in Redemption Church in eight years. If we would continue to say this, no matter what, we're going to seek Jesus. We're going to see a movement of God in our city that's been way more significant than what we've seen him do already. So what is kingdom? Kingdom is this. Kingdom is God's people in God's place under God's rule. Kingdom is is God's people in God's place under God's rule. What does this definition actually teach us? It teaches us that the center of the kingdom is Jesus. That God's kingdom is a place where Jesus will reign as king and he's going to rule and reign over his people called citizens. And so as citizens of God's kingdom, we live our life with radical devotion and radical allegiance to the one who reigns supreme on the throne. Ed Stetzer said it this way. He said, the kingdom is not an idea. It's a citizenship. And you only get to it through the cross. Are you hearing that? We say it this way. The kingdom is when King Jesus gets his way. If he's getting his way in your life, he's first. The kingdom is a here, but also a not yet The kingdom is not just something we experience when we die, but it's something we can actually usher in to 2023. Uh, One person described the kingdom as this, an upside down tornado that's pulling down the things of heaven to earth. That's what we get to do and how we live our lives, making the kingdom of God visible here. And here's the crazy part. You have 35,000 decisions a day to do it. You have 35,000 opportunities every day to make that reality. So where does it start? I think it starts with surrender. You see, there's something about the presence of Jesus that results in our worry fading and our purpose becoming more clear. Here's a question. In verse 33, what does every citizen in God's kingdom actually want? Like, why would you ever want to come be a part of God's kingdom? 
Why would you ever want to have a license that says you're a citizen of the kingdom of God? The answer is found in verse 33. Look at it with me. But seek first the kingdom of God and his what? Righteousness. This is the very reason we want to be part of God's kingdom. The answer is righteousness. And the king is actually righteous. Now here's the thing. Because we lack a biblical worldview in many ways, some of you might actually think that you set the term for how you get into the kingdom, for how you actually become a citizen. I want you to know that's not true. The king sets the terms for what it looks like to be a citizen. The king himself is the standard. So here's the problem. You don't have it. You don't have his righteousness. You see, the king not only sets the standard for righteousness, but he, but he is the only way anyone can actually become righteous. So here's the bad news. You don't have it. You don't have righteousness. But yet here's the good news. The righteousness that King Jesus requires is the very righteousness that King Jesus gives you. He's incredible. Seek first the kingdom. And what we're saying is this. We want the king as a church. Our, our, our vision is to see our city redeemed one life at a time. We're saying this. We want to get as many people as possible to the king. So they too can experience the righteousness that he actually gives. How will that become reality? It's through this, our gospel takeaway this morning. And that is this. In every moment, it's Jesus first always. In every single moment, every single decision, it's Jesus first, always. Hey, church, this is a challenge not just to us corporately. This is a challenge to each and every one of us on an individual level. Let me be honest with you. In 100 years from now, each and every one of us are going to be dead. We're going to be buried next to the family or friends that have passed away before us that we love deeply. And what does that mean? It means this, that strangers are gonna be living in all the homes that we own or all the homes that we built that we love now. Strangers are gonna have that home. All the possessions that you've ever bought in your lifetime, someone else is going to have them if they have any kind of value a hundred years from now. That vehicle that you bought, that you love now, enjoy it. It's going to be junk in a hundred years. It's going to be sitting in a scrapyard for metal. And eventually, we're going to be in a portrait book on the bookshelf from our family that's still alive on earth. And our own descendants won't even remember us. And then eventually, guess what's going to happen? That portrait book that you were on is going to find its way in a box and sit in an attic for another 20 years. And then after that, eventually, someone in that family is going to say, who is this person? And they're going to throw it away. And every memory of you is going to be gone. It's going to be over. This is the best you have to offer to the next generation if you are first. Isn't it beautiful? Or could there be a better way with a better king, someone else who should actually be first in our hearts and in our lives? And so what if we rose up, church, right, for the generations to come to say, you know, we're going to show them what having Christ first actually looks like in our life and in our marriages and our homes and our neighborhoods and our workplaces. We're going to enjoy the life that we have here. We're going to enjoy that car, enjoy the homes, enjoy the possessions, but we're going to help our family and generations understand that this is garbage long term. There's someone better, and his name is Christ. And do you know him? You see, if Jesus is first always, that that simply means this, that, that being a citizen in his kingdom is primary, and being an American citizen is secondary. Are you offended? By the way, I love my American citizenship, and so should you. Jesus didn't say, he never said the goal is to get people to be an American. 
The goal is to get people to the kingdom, church. That's our call. That's our challenge. That's what we strive after, and that's what we want. The question is, do you know King Jesus? Let's pray. Jesus, I want to thank you for your love for us and that you love us deeply. Lord, thank you that you're so clear in your word on what you want us to be about and that you want to be first, Lord, in our lives and in our hearts. And so I just want to pray for Redemption Church as a, as a whole, that, that, that we will make you first. I want to make you to be first in our church corporately, but also in our hearts individually, because our church corporately will suffer, Lord, if you're not reigning in our hearts individually. And so we love you deeply, Jesus. We need you. We need your presence. We need your spirit to continue to work in our hearts and our lives to reveal what needs to go in our life and, and where it is that you need to be primary in your name. Amen.